I'm Kirsty Duffy, and I have a confession to make. I'm an experimental particle physicist. I've been studying neutrinos for eight years, first on the T2K experiment in Japan, and now on the microboon experiment at Fermilab. But I've never seen a neutrino. In fact, it's not just me, no one has ever seen a neutrino. And if they tell you they have, they're lying. Now you might be thinking, that's just because they're really small, right? You need fancy equipment to see neutrinos, like you need fancy equipment to see individual electrons. And that's, that's kind of true, but actually it's more complicated than that. It turns out that neutrino detectors don't directly detect neutrinos either. So how in the world can we study them? That's what we're talking about today on Even Bananas. Neutrinos are notoriously antisocial. They don't emit or absorb light, they don't have an electric charge, so you can't detect them with circuits or magnets, and they're incredibly lightweight. They're hundreds or thousands of times lighter than an electron, so detecting their gravitational influence is a no-go too. In fact, the only way to study neutrinos is through their interactions with the nuclear weak force. But of course, these interactions are extremely rare. For every 10 trillion neutrinos from the sun that pass through the thickest part of the Earth, only one of them interacts with an atom inside the Earth. The rest just go on their way without so much of a greeting. How rude. But when a neutrino does interact with an atom, it produces other particles like electrons or photons that we can detect. So we detect neutrinos by looking for the particles they produce when they interact, rather than by seeing the neutrinos themselves. Now, of course, just because we spot an electron or a particle of light doesn't mean that it came from a neutrino interaction. And figuring out whether it did or not is part of the puzzle. And we've got quite good at that over the years. When Wolfgang Pauli predicted the existence of neutrinos, many physicists, including Pauli, thought it would be impossible to find them because of how rarely they interacted with other matter. So if you were going to have any chance of spotting them, you needed two main things a huge number of neutrinos, or their antimatter counterparts, antineutrinos, that would work too, and a large detector. After World War II, one of the most obvious sources of antineutrinos was an atomic bomb. The same fission processes that caused the explosion also released a deluge of antineutrinos. So two physicists testing atomic bombs at Los Alamos National Lab hatched a plan to detect the antineutrinos from a bomb. They gave their plan the excellent name Project Poltergeist. And the detector they planned to use would use a recently discovered substance that acted as a liquid scintillator. Now what that means is it's a liquid that when charged particles or high energy photons pass through it, emits flashes of visible light. And the more energetic the particle, the brighter the light that you see. To have any chance of success, the experiment would have to be really close to the bomb. Rhinus and Cowan estimated about 50 meters away. But of course, then you have to work out how to make sure your detector doesn't get blown up. Now, the plan that they came up with was to drop the detector down a deep shaft at the exact moment of detonation. That way, the shockwave passing through the Earth doesn't hit the detector because the detector is in freefall, so it doesn't mess up your data. The detector would then land on a foam bed of rubber and feathers, be nice and cushioned, the scientists would wait a few days for the radioactivity to quiet down and then go in and retrieve the detector and see if it had picked up any neutrinos. What can go wrong? Now, as crazy as that scheme sounds, it actually was approved by the director of the lab. That just goes to show how determined scientists were to detect neutrinos. Unfortunately for fans of chaos, before they could actually do the experiment, someone said, wait a minute, why are you using a nuclear bomb instead of just a nuclear reactor? Nuclear reactors make a lot of antineutrinos too, and they have the advantage of not being a bomb. So, in spring 1953, Rhinus and Cowan and their colleagues set up their 300 litre detector at a fission reactor in Hanford, Washington. The result was tantalising, but it wasn't quite definitive proof of the existence of neutrinos. The team went back to the drawing board. They spent a year redesigning every aspect of the detector, they even cooked up new recipes for the scintillator. The team took data for five months. Like any good scientist, they tested every alternative explanation for their observations that they could think of. But everything checked out with Wolfgang Pauli's predictions. So on June 14th, 1956, 
Rhinus and Cowan sent a telegram to Pauli announcing their discovery of neutrinos, 26 years after Pauli had predicted their existence. Now to talk about how current neutrino experiments work, I'm going to call in my friend and colleague, Katrina Miller. Katrina works with me on the microbin experiment at Fermilab, and she's a PhD candidate at the University of Chicago. So one of the first things I wanted to ask you is, are there experiments that still use liquid scintillator to detect neutrinos? Yes. So there's a neutrino experiment at Fermilab called NOVA, roughly 30 or so stories underground. Um, and it's made out of hollow plastic tubes that are filled with liquid scintillator, just like Project Poltergeist. Um, and I actually have a small piece of NOVA right here. So the plastic tubes have been arranged in layers like so, alternating between an up and down layer and then right next to it, left and right. Uh, so if a flash is seen in an up and down tube, and then in the other layer over in a left-right tube, NOVA scientists can use this to figure out which way the, the neutrino was traveling. And I might also have some liquid scintillator here. So this is pretty much just baby oil, um, but without the added fragrance. Instead, it has a bit of scintillating material mixed in, uh, which is what makes it light up when charged particles or photons pass through it. And I can shine a UV light and actually show you uh, what happens to the liquid uh, when photons... Oh, wow. Yeah, so this is how NOVA researchers can detect the presence of neutrinos. So wait, what do neutrinos actually look like in NOVA? So this image here shows a top-down view and a side view of a neutrino event. So the really long track is a muon, um, and that's how scientists can identify that it was a muon neutrino that came into the detector. Um, and you'll also see that there's a spray of shorter tracks close to the neutrino interaction point which are heavier particles coming from the nucleus of the atom hit by the incoming neutrino. And each of these plastic tubes corresponds to a single pixel in the image. Are there any other experiments that use kind of similar technologies? Yeah, so right next to NOVA is the Minerva detector, um, which also uses a scintillator, um, but instead of liquid, they use a solid material. Uh, so it's the same general idea, but the detector is built with these solid plastic bars. Um, that light up when a charged particle travels through. So we can actually take a closer look at one of the bars, um, and you might see down the middle that there's an optical fiber running through the center. So this is what carries light to photosensors for detection. What do neutrinos look like in Minerva then? Do they look the same? Here's an example of the same type of neutrino uh, captured in the Minerva detector. You can see again that there are these charged particle tracks um, coming from a common neutrino interaction point. Do you notice anything similar about this event image in comparison to NOVA's? Yeah, it looks really similar, but like the first thing I noticed is that same really long track, which you said in NOVA was a muon. Exactly. So again, we're looking at a muon neutrino event, but this time in Minerva. But Fermilab isn't the only place where neutrino detectors exist, right, Kirsty? Um, I believe you did your PhD on T2K in Japan, um, and that uses the Super Kamiokande detector. How does that one work? Yeah, so Super Kamiokande, or Super K, is a very different type of detector from the ones you've been talking about, Katrina. It's what's called a water Sherenkov detector. So basically what it is, is a giant cylindrical tank filled with water, and it's so big you could row around inside the detector in a boat, which they do. And it detects particles by a thing called Sherenkov radiation, which is basically a light equivalent of a sonic boom when a particle goes faster than the local speed of light. But wait, I thought things can't move faster than the speed of light. That is an excellent point. Einstein tells us that things can't go faster than the speed of light, which is definitely true. Um, but light slows down when it goes through something like water or glass. And so when it's going through something, it is possible for a high energy particle to go faster than the light is going once it's been slowed down without breaking the cosmic speed limit. This is what a neutrino event looks like in Super K. Here we're seeing um, the circle from that kind of sonic boom of light that's been picked up. And so each one of those circles is basically one particle. And so by looking at the pattern on the walls, um, that's how scientists can reconstruct the particles and then work out where the neutrino was. I think it's super cool that it's using this uh, really kind of crazy physics to detect particles. But the last major type of detector we haven't talked about is liquid argon. Um, and we both work together on a liquid argon experiment. So do you want to talk about how that works? Absolutely. Um, so of course, there's Microboon, uh, which is a huge tank about the size of a school bus. 
uh, filled with 170 tons of liquid argon uh, that's been cooled down to negative 186 degrees Celsius. Uh, so when neutrinos hit an argon nucleus, uh, the collision generates a slew of charged particles that travel through the liquid and knock electrons off of the argon atoms. And there's also photosensors equipped to catch flashes of light from ionized or excited argon atoms. Let me give you an example of a different type of neutrino event in Microboon. So this looks really similar to the Nova Minerva ones. You can see the stuff appearing out of nowhere for a neutrino, but, but that's not a long muon track like we've seen before. So what's going on there? Yeah, so instead of a really long muon track, we now have this energetic shower-like branching and these showers are how electrons interact in microboon. So scientists can point to these to say with confidence that we've detected an electron neutrino. So what's so special about liquid argon? Why are we so excited about it? Um, it's pretty dense, which is important for studying neutrinos because that means we have a higher chance of neutrinos coming and interacting in our detector. Um, it's relatively cheap, so we can use a bunch of it, uh, which we definitely need. It's um, also inert, so we don't have to worry about electrons being captured by the argon rather than collected um, and measured. Um, that's not to say it's without its challenges. It requires a lot of engineering work to cool down to that low temperature for us to use but I still think it's a very affordable and worthwhile use um, in studying neutrinos. So do a lot of people because we're actually working on a pretty exciting liquid argon detector for the future. Um, do you wanna tell us a little bit about that? Uh, so when we think about um, the future, there's Dune, uh, which will be the largest liquid argon detector we've ever built. There will be four modules, each the size of about a jumbo jet, uh, weighing 17,000 tons each, or the size of 100 microboons. And I have to say, um, the first time someone told me that, I didn't believe it, so I looked it up. Uh, and it is, one June module is actually longer than a Dreamliner plane. <laughs> yeah, so it's a lot bigger. The key difference between Dune and Microboon is that Dune is a two-detector system. Using a two-detector system has some pretty cool advantages, um, but I think that's a story for another day. But for now, thank you so much, Katrina. That was really interesting talking about all the ways we detect neutrinos in modern neutrino experiments. Thanks for having me. Bye. That's it for this episode of Even Bananas. 